From here, I'm Matt Driscoll, live, sort of, in Singapore. That's right, we made the big move from Hong Kong a long time ago, and we're now broadcasting live, sort of, from Singapore. Today, we are continuing the SEC Speaker Series. Uh, the topic today, women in public policy, tales from the front lines from the deserts of Iraq to the steppes of Mongolia. The speaker, Piper Campbell, she's the U.S. ambassador to Mongolia. A little bit more about her in just a minute. Many of you know the FCC in Hong Kong. Many of you know it's a key stop on the itineraries of the most well-known people in the world who happen to be passing through the city. The view from here is pleased to announce we've got the complete set of speeches dating all the way back to 2007. That's more than the club itself has up on their website. And we're uploading each and every speech from 2013 as fast as we can. Speakers and topics in the series include people like Mia Farrow, famous actress, outspoken activist on China and Darfur. We've got Bill Clinton in conversation with Lee Kuan Yew, the founder of Modern Day Singapore. And we've got people like Chris Patton, the last governor of Hong Kong before it was handed back to China. We've also got people like comedian, author, Michael Palin of Monty Python fame, and we've got many, many more. Check back frequently on The View from here to get the latest podcast. Don't forget, you can also log on to iTunes and subscribe to The View from here, and that way you won't miss a key speech. Just go to the iTunes store, do a search for me, Matt Driscoll, or The View from here, and subscribe. And that way, each and every suite should be downloaded straight to your iPod, your iPhone, your iPad. A little bit more about today's offering. The topic, as I said, women in public policy, tales from the front lines, from the deserts of Iraq to the steppes of Mongolia. The speaker, Piper Camel, she's the current U.S. ambassador to Mongolia. And according to the propaganda I've been handed... Uh, Ambassador Campbell served as the senior civilian representative of the U.S. government in southern Iraq from 2011 to 2012. Uh, she established a U.S. consulate general in Basra and managed uh, continued interaction as the U.S. military departed the country. Uh, she talks about her experiences in Iraq and other destinations as a senior woman in public policy. Ambassador Campbell joined the Foreign Service in 1989, began her diplomatic career as a consular and administrative officer in the Philippines, and she was a general services officer uh, providing support to the three U.S. missions in Belgium. Uh, she served in the State Department's Operations Center from 1994 to 1995, uh, the Bureau of International Organization Affairs from 95 to 96, and then she was seconded to the Civil Affairs section of the U.N. Peacekeeping Mission, uh, 1996 to 1998. Uh, she then opened an office for USAID in Slavonia in Croatia, uh, and she's worked in international security and humanitarian issues in the U.S. mission to the United Nations in New York and in Geneva from 2002 to 2006. And she also served as the deputy chief of mission in Cambodia from 2006 to 2009. Uh, she's got a bachelor's degree from Georgetown University School of Foreign Service, very good school there, and a master's degree from the Harvard Kennedy School. Well, that's it for me, Matt Driscoll. That's the view from here. Stay tuned. The topic, Women in Public Policy, tales from the front lines from the deserts of Iraq to the steppes of Mongolia. The speaker, Piper Campbell, U.S. Ambassador of Mongolia. She is next. Good afternoon, everyone. Sorry to interrupt what looks like a very sociable lunch. Welcome to the FCC. My name is Tara Joseph. I'm a Reuters journalist and president of the FCC this year. Pleasure to have you, and it's an honor to have Ambassador Piper Campbell from Mongolia visiting us in Hong Kong. I've been hearing lots of interesting stories. So for those of us who think it's a big adventure to go over to Kowloon for a business meeting, uh, we're going to hear about some tales from the front line that are quite different and I must say quite exotic uh, from Ambassador Campbell. As you know, she's currently based in Mongolia, but she's had many experiences in Iraq and Cambodia, among other destinations. She also has some experience in the Philippines um, in part of her previous work, which of course is, is very current given what's going on over there and the U.S. Uh, military help that's gone in uh, into the region. So with that in mind, uh, just let me give you some ideas of upcoming events that we're having at the club. Our next lunch, as we start to wind down into the Christmas season, 
will take place on the 26th of November, that's next week, and we'll be talking about Asian currency markets after the Fed stimulus um, with um, Mr. Enzio von Feil, who's an analyst based here in Hong Kong, so we hope you can join us for that, and do keep uh, track of our website for any other talks coming up. And with that, it's my pleasure to invite Ambassador Campbell to come speak. Okay. Good. So, an interesting fact is that um, Celsius and Fahrenheit, at, neg at the temperature negative 38, Celsius and Fahrenheit coincide. We get those sorts of temperatures in, in Mongolia. In fact, we get them every winter. Um, and as, as the winter rolls around, more and more Mongolians are asking me, you know, how are you going to do? What do you think of our weather? Are you ready for the winter? And uh, I usually respond by, by noting that I grew up in Buffalo, New York. All right, we have a Buffalonian in the audience. That's great. And I loved growing up in Buffalo. It was a, a wonderful place. And I have a, a classic Buffalo chip on my shoulder. Um, so anybody else who maligns Buffalo, I'll beat them up immediately. But it's, it is one of the coldest and one of the snowiest places in the United States. And so the point that I make to Mongolians is that I know snow. Um, I don't, however, know negative 38 degree Celsius and Fahrenheit temperatures so much. We don't get those in Buffalo. When people push me a bit and they say, oh yeah, but it's not that cold in Buffalo, or we really, we're really the toughest, I usually then add um, that I spent a year in Iraq before coming to Mongolia. And that, for me, the most wonderful thing about Mongolia is the, how quickly you can get outside the city and how absolutely beautiful the, the wide open spaces are. For somebody who spent a year uh, with a security team of 20 people who lived in a container with a hard cover over it and who worked in a building with in, which was actually a building built inside a barn so that when we had incoming, they would explode over the top of the barn and the barn would sort of disperse uh, the impact. Uh, that to come from that kind of environment and to go to a place where I'm absolutely free to walk the streets without any, anybody um, protecting me, where I can walk out into the countryside and ask somebody if I may borrow their horse for a little while and uh, go for a ride on my own, that it is in a way like a balm for my, no, not balm, but balm for my soul after, after the time in Iraq. So when we were trying to think up a, a topic, I thought, and I was asked to speak to about Iraq, I thought it might actually be more interesting to talk about what an, a transition from someplace like Iraq to someplace like Mongolia, what that feels like. I was thinking, though, about the fact that I don't usually immediately mention Iraq. I start with Buffalo, and it's, it's really only when somebody pushes me that I sort of talk about Iraq. And in a way, that's because even though it's been 15 months now since I left, uh, left Iraq, it is still a very kind of fresh and intense experience, and one which is difficult to describe, difficult to explain to people who haven't uh, worked in an environment like that. I thought, however, that I'd, I'd give it a little bit of a, a try. And I, I really hope, if, uh, if I'm not clear, if people have questions, that we can come back to this in, in the question and answer period. Um, I should perhaps explain that I worked in southern Iraq. So I was not in Baghdad. I was in a town called Basra, which is in the Shia-dominated Shia southern half of the country. I was the council general which is the senior American um, in the area. Um, I th in Hong coming to Hong Kong, I should probably don't need to explain the role of consulates. 
in many places I have to explain the difference between a, a consulate and an embassy, but I, I would imagine that's something that's quite obvious to, to this audience. Um, I, the story of how I came to be in Iraq is a little bit corny. So I apologize in advance, but it has the advantage of being absolutely true. I um, was working, I was chief of staff to the deputy secretary of state. And our particular areas of focus were Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Iraq. And based in Washington, we were managing the US element of the civilian surge in Afghanistan we were handling primarily the economic aspects of our relationship with Pakistan and also looking at the civilian elements of the what we had expected would be a military drawdown, but what we expected would be a, a continuation of the military presence, U.S. military presence in Iraq. So from 2009 to 2011, that was my job. And during that period of time, I was based in Washington, but traveled quite regularly to Afghanistan, Pakistan, and, and Iraq. There were two deputy secretaries, and the other one, the chief of staff of the other one, was going to Tokyo, Paris, Buenos Aires, and I, I sometimes would scratch my head and try to figure out what had I done wrong. But in fact, uh, as I was explaining, most of my career in the Foreign Service has been focused on conflict and post-conflict situations the Balkans, I worked on Indonesia and East Timor, um, and so in, in wet Cambodia. And so Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Iraq were natural continuations of what's really been my area of focus over a 24-year career. I was slated to go to be U.S. ambassador to a small African country um, and went out with my then boss, who's now the Treasury Secretary, Jack Lew, uh, on a trip to Iraq, we, and we were talking with American diplomats who were at some of the provincial reconstruction teams. In 2011, with the U.S. military having a presence throughout Iraq, we had small groups of diplomats in, a, in 20 different sites in Iraq. But we knew as the U.S. military drew down, we had to restructure the civilian presence. And so the plan was to go from these 20 small hubs to three consulates, one in the north, dealing with the Kurdish area, one in the south, dealing predominantly with Shia issues, as well as Basra, which is the, the source of 80% of, of Iraq's oil production. And then one we planned at that time, that there would also be one along the, the fault line, the Kurdish-Iraqi fault line. We were at one of those sites in the summer of 2010, and talking with people about the transition that would occur in 2011. And uh, the senior diplomat, a person I respect very much, but the person I was talking to said, God, it is going to be really hard next summer. It's going to be really hard as the U.S. military withdraws and the diplomats really have to step to the fore. And he said, and I remember it so clearly, he said, I would not want that job. <laughs> And I started to explain to him why they were the most important jobs, they were going to be the most important jobs in the Foreign Service, how the people in those jobs were going to be implementing what I thought was the most important element of U.S. foreign policy at the time. And I actually got one of those, I had one of those out-of-body experiences and a little voice on my shoulder, which said, you know, if you believe this as passionately as you're professing to do, you need to, you need to look at doing something about it more than just talking about it. So I went back to Washington and began the process of sort of unwinding my assignment and volunteered to go to Basra. So I have only myself to blame for ending up in Basra, the hottest posting in the U.S. Foreign Service in the summer of 2011. And I was there for a year from, uh, from June 10th, 2011 to June 10th, 2012. The first six months of that period, I was co-located with the U.S. military. And what we did was we, actually, we took a U.S. military base and we built within that base 
a small consulate. We used to call, explain it, you had to think of it almost like a donut hole. So you had a base which had walls around it and was externally protected by the US military. And then within that base, we actually moved walls around and we created this much smaller facility that we knew we could protect. And that facility was built almost as if it were a submarine. We were able to produce our, or maintain our own food. We could generate our own water supply. We could handle our black water. Um, and we were equipped in every way basically to exist without any support from the outside for a month. After a month it would have gotten dicey, but we absolutely were self-contained for up to a month. I had a thousand people working for me in that, in that venture. Everything from cooks to security guards to the very specialized people who manned the equipment, which had the strange name of giraffe, which was a, a facility with a long, actually a long neck and a head that moved around that looked for incoming and made noise that said incoming, 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 coming, take cover if we had missiles coming into the facility. And we did. Um, and then, having established this little hole inside the donut, the, the, the donut, the military presence, actually started to fall away. And in December 2011, the final US military departed Iraq. Actually, the absolute last convoys left from Basra because we had created our little donut and they were able to stay inside of our area during the very last stage of the military departure. So as of December 14th, 2011, the US military was gone and the sole US presence in Southern Iraq was our consulate. And the first couple days, the first couple weeks, we sort of hunkered down and watched and waited to see what that would look like, what sorts of activities we would be able to do. Because you don't pay the money to create a submarine in the desert in Iraq and staff it with a thousand people purely for sort of the symbolic, we're here. You put people there, you ask them to take those personal risks and to undergo that personal hardship in order for them to be able to interact with the local population, in order for them to be able to provide information, both to the local population and to the United States, and in order to support, in the case of Basra, the, uh, the US companies involved in the oil production. And I'm really pleased to say that we were able to do that during the la latter six months of my presence in Iraq, and we continue to do that. So I was in Washington just last week and had a chance to sort of check up on um, how Basra is doing. And we recent, the U.S. recently hosted a visit to the United States from the governor of Basra. We created a sister city arrangement between Houston and Basra. And so the governor came to the, the states and signed this sister city agreement. There's a lot of logical connections between Basra and Houston. Um, exchanges from southern Iraq to the United States continue. And in fact, although there are many challenges right now in Iraq and in the U.S.-Iraqi relationship, um, it does seem um, that the consulate in Basra is still doing very good work and very solid work. And oil production from southern Iraq continues even at a time that the um, issues in the, in, it, with northern oil production have become more complicated. And so it was not an easy period, um, but I feel very proud about what the U.S. government, about what people from civilian agencies, most notably the Department of State, were able to do in taking over many of the responsibilities from the US military in southern Iraq. One of my primary interlocutors on the Iraqi side was a general, General Mohammed, 
who was responsible for security for the Iraqi Defense Forces for southern Iraq. And when General Mohammed, who was kind of lugubrious, if General Mohammed was a dog, he would have been a great Dane. He sort of moved slowly, he was very thoughtful, kind of had a hung, hung dog look. And when General Mohammed heard that I was going to Mongolia, he didn't ask why, he didn't comment that I'd be going from one of the hottest places in the world to the coldest. He said, I'm going to come and visit you. I said, okay, that would be great. And he said, no, I am going to come and visit you. And I said, that would be lovely. Mongolia is really interesting. And he repeated it a third time and with the same like steady delivery. I will come visit you in Mongolia. I said, Mohammed, clearly this is something you feel, you feel strongly about. What, why do you want to come so much to Mongolia? And he said, they visited us twice. <laughs> <laughs> Which I have to note, when I, when I repeat that story to Mongolians, they love it. They love the fact that people in Iraq know Mongolian history, know that Mongolia invaded, sacked Baghdad, um, and then returned as part of coalition operations. Um, and so I, I get a lot of use out of that particular story. Mohammed still hasn't come to visit me yet. But uh, I have another two years in, in Mongolia, so we'll see. Um, as I mentioned, one of the things that, Mo that Mohammed didn't touch on was sort of the question of why would you go from one of the hottest places in the world to one of the coldest? What's the connection between this conflict-ridden southern Iraq and um, peaceful Mongolia? And for myself, I had to sort of figure out what was the explanation, what were the linkages. One of the, for, and for me, the most important is that southern Iraq and Mongolia are both very dynamic, dynamic places economically and commercially. Mongolia, with something between 12 and 17 percent GDP growth, is one of the fastest growing frontier economies in the world. And the primary reason that I'm in Hong Kong right now is that there is an investment conference on Mongolia going on today and tomorrow. Um, so although I thought when I, when I indicated an interest in going to Mongolia, I thought that the, my focus on Asian issues, which is my, sort of my primary focus in my Foreign Service career, has been this conflict and post-conflict. But I joined the Foreign Service 20 year, four years ago expecting to specialize in Asia with a background in, in Japan and a certificate in Asian studies. The conflict and post-conflict, there haven't been enough conflicts in Asia. So I worked on Indonesia and East Timor, but other than that, most of my career, and I worked in Cambodia, but most of my career, in fact, has ended up focusing on places other than Asia. After Iraq, I knew that I was, just wasn't ready for a, another conflict. And so Mongolia was very intentionally a, a shift of direction, shift in focus. But I wanted to still continue to try to build on skills and experience. And for me, what has been one of the nicest things about the move from Iraq to Mongolia has been that a lot of the experience that I developed in southern Iraq in a very challenging environment, thinking about economic and commercial issues, is actually still quite relevant in Mongolia in a less challenging but equally interesting environment. Um, the other thing is, I, I kind of feel like I'm the, the spearhead of the whole pivot to Asia. So the Obama administration's very much stressed that while Afghanistan and Iraq and Pakistan and the Middle East are, are all, continue to be important to the administration, that they've recognized that there needs to be additional attention, additional effort to Asia. And so that's why they sent me to Mongolia, or at least that's what I like to think. It's funny, um, as I was preparing my remarks, I, I had, felt like I had to uh, figure out a way to get into the remarks, the comment, the fact that in fact I was already slated for an ambassadorial post before I went to Iraq. And it's, it's uh, I admit to sort of almost a, 
a weakness in an, this area. I always feel like I have to explain to people, I didn't get the assignment to Mongolia as payment for having done Iraq. Um, and I don't know, maybe nobody else cares about that point as much as I do. But there, sometimes there's sort of an assumption that you do things that are difficult because you're looking for what comes next. Um, and for me, it's, it's really important also, I'll just be straightforward to say that I went to Iraq because I believed that, as I said, it was an incredibly opportune time and that there was nothing else that was going to be as, as important in shaping U.S. policy and U.S. focus for the next decade. And I knew when I went to Iraq that I would be going to Mongolia next. And so in a, throughout that year, when things were really tough in Iraq, I always had sort of that balance, that knowledge that I just had to make it through that period of time. And then I could shift to sort of using different parts of my personality, different skills. Uh, but I do regularly come back to and feel that there was a value to the work that I did in Iraq. And I think that it contributes quite a bit to my, um, my decision making and my approach to the job now in Mongolia. I try not too often to say, this is important, but it's not a matter of life and death. But I regularly think that. And when we're working through stress stressful issues in the US-Mongolian relationship, I have a very useful, larger picture that I regularly keep in mind which says, this is important. We need to work on it. We need to give it our effort. But let's keep this in a broader context. And so for me, one of my key takeaways from Iraq, something that I know will shape my approach wherever I go in the US Foreign Service, is a very important, broader picture. So I think I've probably talked for about 20 minutes. I didn't time that. Um, but I have all sorts of other things that I can talk about women in development, the importance of having men interested in supporting women in this area, uh, thoughts from, uh, from Lean In and sort of how you apply that in, in this area. But perhaps rather than, rather than covering any of that, what I'd love to do is, is take some questions and see where, where the conversation flows. And do you want me to do that from here or from there? Whichever you prefer. Why don't I move back over there? It'll make it more like a conversation. I totally lost track of time. I was uh, so entranced there. So we have about 10 minutes uh, for question and answers. If you just want to raise your hand, we'll bring a microphone around. And um, over here. Hi. Um, when you went to Iraq, you had some specific objectives in mind. It was really an idealistic decision, and it was very important. What, what's, you know, what do you hope to accomplish in Mongolia? What are, your, what are you trying to do? Last year, the United States of Mongolia celebrated the 25th anniversary of bilateral relations, which I, I remark mostly because I think it's fascinating to think about how young that relationship is. There's probably people in this room who have children who've been alive longer than the U.S. and Mongolia have had bilateral relations. Well, to co sort of continue the, the child analogy, when Mongolia was born, when Mongolia as a democracy was born in, in 1991, they, take, they took sort of this incredible brave decision for, to be for a democracy, to be a democracy in a rather difficult neighborhood. And they needed a lot of, of support. So the first 25 years of the U.S.-Mongolia relationship was very much a development-driven relationship. Over that period of time, the United States government and the United States people provided over half a billion dollars of development assistance to Mongolia. Mongolia is one of the fastest growing economies in the world. As I said, between 12 and, and 17 percent GDP growth. The Economist magazine calls it like Mongolia and um, really puts a stress on, on this growth. And the U.S. relationship with Mongolia needs to change. It needs to mature and it needs to stop being a development-based relationship and become an economic and commercial partnership. 
So my goal during my period in, in Mongolia is to quite quickly steer the embassy and steer the relationship away from a development-focused relationship to one that's based on economic deals between the government of Mongolia and U.S. companies, and where the companies and the government and the people of Mongolia all understand what role the U.S. government naturally would play um, and where those economic relationships are healthy, which is no small deal. Thank you. Right over here, and then we'll move our way down the table. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, Just a I'm quick a note, if you wouldn't mind telling us your name okay. and where uh, you're affiliated. I'm Yed Widor, uh, professor uh, of the Mongolian National University. Thank you very much for your nice uh, remarks. And uh, I'm the one uh, who actually twice Iraq, right? Oh. <laughs> so the question is, um, of course, it's been a long time since uh, Mongolia has been a superpower. And so now uh, there are a lot of opportunities for uh, not only uh, those uh, who's interested in Mongolian history or uh, Mongolia's development. It will be an opportunity for uh, those who would like to uh, invest in Mongolia in one or other ways. As a, repres a representative of the educational um, uh, institution, uh, I would like to hear your views on um, how far, uh, I would like to uh, learn uh, from your experience how you see the uh, role of education sector for the future development, mm -hmm. especially in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Wow, there are so, ma so many different way things that come to my mind when I think about that. But um, I guess just a couple. The first is that the educational exchanges between the United States and Mongolia are very strong and very important. Two interesting facts. Mongolia is one of the few governments which supplements the U.S. government Fulbright program by actually pay also paying for F Mongolian students to go and study in the United States. And so we have a, a combined Fulbright program with the government of Mongolia where we choose 10 students and jointly, the U.S. and Mongolia choose an extra 10. And so twice as many Mongolian students are, are able to, stu to study in the United States as would otherwise because the government of Mongolia has recognized the importance of, of the program. In addition to which, President El Bagdorj has made a commitment that any Mongolian student who gets into one of the 100 best universities globally uh, that the government needs additional financial assistance that the government of Mongolia will help with that. Now I have a couple beefs with, with that, including how do you figure out what are the 100 best universities in the world, and recognition that in some cases, for some students, going to the best university is not really the answer. And I, so I regularly talk to Mongolian students about the, the strength of state, the state system in the, the U.S., you know, SUNY, the the SUNY schools in New York State are, are fantastic. And if you're looking at something like mining or agriculture, the, you know, there are many schools in the United States that might not be Yale or Harvard, but which have incredibly strong areas of concentration. So those are too small. Also, I'm not quite sure how you implement this program. But beyond those caveats, I think the commitment to education is incredibly important. Um, and then, well, what, maybe I'll just stop with those two. Because, uh, but I do agree that, that education is an incredibly important area. The U.S. just finished a Millennium Compact, a five-year, $285 million program with Mongolia. And one of the areas of focus for that was actually vocational training um, and with some specific focus on, on the mining sector. Because I think in addition to university education, it's important as well to build technical skills. Florence? Yes, my name is Florence de Changy. I report for uh, Le Monde uh, in France. Considering your um, incredibly privileged uh, knowledge into the Iraq uh, file, could you, would you be able to give us a quick assessment mm -hmm. of what, is, what the overall uh, commitment in Iraq is perceived like in Washington? especially in terms of uh, results, results 
against cost and cost not only the billions, hundreds of billions or whatever it is, but also psychological cost uh, for American people and for Iraqi people and diplomatic, diplomatic costs. So basically, how when you assess the, the whole episode, how, how do you see it? Success, uh, mix, or? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I'm also very conscious that the situation in, in Iraq is evolving rapidly, and it's 15 months since I left Iraq. And so while I continue to watch, continue to read, you know, really at this point, most of my information about Iraq comes from, from the media, uh, as opposed to that inside and that, that direct knowledge that I had a year ago. Um, certainly, speaking personally, the, the levels of violence that, that we see month on mo month um, in Iraq it, it is really a, a matter of, of great concern. Um, uh, we, since I left the consulate a year ago, two key contacts of, of the consulate have been killed, two Iraqis, so you see the statistics and, and they're important and bother you, but when it's a person you knew, a person who you cared about, uh, it, it takes on a totally different dimension. Mm -hmm. um, as I watched the U.S. military departing Iraq, it was clear for those soldiers, many of whom were on their second or third tour in Iraq, that they needed to feel that that effort uh, and their personal sacrifices uh, had contributed to stabilizing the situation in Iraq. Uh, and so I, I have, and I think will continue to have, so many different feelings and so such mixed feelings about Iraq. And I, I think it's, it's a bit trite, but really in, in so many ways the the measure of, of Iraq and the, the answer to your question is not going to be something that we can say today or could say a year ago, but rather is really going to be a, a, question, a question of watching what happens in Iraq over the next decade. So at, at the moment there is no easy, clear assessment like, like this was a mission worth doing or mixed feelings mm -hmm. or, uh, mm -hmm. I mean surely it must be classified somehow. I think that I think that there are as many different views on on that as there are. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. We have time for two more questions. We'll we'll go over here to the gentleman in the glasses, and then we'll wind up with AFP. <laughs> uh, uh, Jim Seymour, Chinese University of Hong Kong. Uh, I'm interested in Mongolia's development. Uh, so, so many countries suffer from what's known as the resource cur cur curse. Rich in resources, but somehow as they get developed, the general population does not benefit. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering if Mongolia is going to be able to avoid the resource curse. I know there was some talk about, uh, I don't know how far it got, whether it really happened, giving uh, all the citizens a few shares of some of the new corporations so that all the corporations don't end up being owned entirely by uh, powerful, politically powerful families, as happens some places. Um, so I just wonder, is uh, Mongolia's development of its resources taking place in a manner that's benefiting the general population? Are you optimistic about that? I think that the two things that are most in Mongolia's favor in terms of answering that question positively over time are the fact that this question is so much discussed in Mongolia. And so there are conferences, um, the president res regularly speaks about, the newspapers regularly write about uh, with an assessment of is Mongolia avoiding the curse, is it the Dutch curse, is it Will uh, being a signatory to the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative help? Will inviting the United Nations to come in and look at the human, human rights in a business perspective help? And so the awareness of the problem, and, as well as a really quite subtle look at what happened in those countries. What did those countries do wrong? What, what did countries like Norway, which could have had the same resource course, but avoided it. What did they do right? Um, that 
the liveliness of that debate in Mongolia is a very is a very positive thing. Um, and then the other thing is that um, the I was saying earlier the government of Mongolia is to in my personal experience unique in its willingness to admit when it makes mistakes. And so just on on Saturday the president held a sort of a special summit where he talked about some of the problems that the Mongolian economy is currently facing. And it was such a s sort of extraordinary mea culpa of him saying, my gover I was elected, my, my government was elected in the parliamentary elections a year ago, I was re-elected in June this year, and we've got some real problems. FDI is down, there's inflation, the currency is, is going up quickly against the dollar, and we all need to take responsibility for that. And so I think it's very healthy that there's a debate around the resource curse. It's very healthy that this is a government which is willing to talk quite openly and publicly about challenges in managing the, the growth of the economy. It may even be healthy in the long term that this super hot economy has cooled down a little bit and therefore there, there's some time to, to readjust. The challenges are there. We are seeing some, we are seeing that the, the mineral, the econ economic growth has had widespread benefit. So for example, just over a two year period that UNDP was me measuring poverty rates, 10% of the population graduated out of poverty which is extraordinary. You just, you don't find figures like that. But still, 28% of the Mongolian popu population is living at or below the poverty line. And there is an increasing divide between a relatively wealthy urban population, about just about 50% of the population, a little more than 50, 60% of the population lives in urban, in urban areas. And the poverty rate among the rural poor is dramatically higher than, than in urban centers. And so in the presidential election, which took place, as I said, in June, this question of how to manage natural resources for the benefit of the, of the whole population was really the core debate in, in the national election and how to manage this to the benefit of the rural population as well as the urban populations is also a very real and present debate and conversation. We have time for one more quick question down at the uh, end. Hi, I'm Laura from Agence France Press, AFP. Um, just a quick one on the slowing of the economy this year. Do you think that that has affected the investment environment, or do you think that it's still a positive investment environment for Mongolia? Um, the investment environment during most of this year has been very sour. Um, we've seen more sort of more investors, more institutional investors, and more companies departing Mongolia than coming in. Oyu Togwai, this l very large copper and gold mine development in the southern part of the country has become kind of the bellwether indicator of uh, the health of, of the economy writ large. Um, I would say it's become sort of an unhealthy bellwether. You can't have the measure of an entire economy being the, the pace of negotiations on one specific deal. Um, one of the things that, that we're seeing right now is that specific actions of, of the government of Mongolia seem to be shifting, the, perhaps sweetening the, this sour mood. And so at this investors con um, conference, which I'm attending here, I'd say that there is more interest and a little bit more openness to hearing what the government of Mongolia is doing asking about the actions which are going to follow now that the legal framework has been improved and now that a new investment law has, has been passed. And so I think there is a, well, throughout the sessions this morning, 
the term that was being used is cautious optimism. And on that cautiously optimistic note, uh, it's gone to a clock. So Ambassador Campbell, thank you very much for joining us today. And I wish everyone a pleasant afternoon.